Hello and welcome to Women We Watch in Tourism podcast series. WWW is a platform where we provide a space for women to leverage collective wisdom, experiences and inspiration from women powerhouses in our industry to become innovative game changers. We will be engaging in insightful conversations with women who have changed the face of businesses in our industry and trailblazers who have steered innovative and creative ideas. This is a must-listen podcast for women leaders, professionals and entrepreneurs to become visible, break glass ceilings and to grow their impact. We believe that sharing these insights will be a catalyst for women in our industry to unleash their potentials and to seize the crisis as a turning point. So join our conversations by subscribing to Women We Watch in Tourism podcast. I firmly believe, Nisha, that in her former life, Mother Nature was a tourism practitioner. Because the, the changes that are being forced have been, and I use the word forced purposely, have been smart. Mm-hmm. And, um, because if you think about it, all the challenges we were dealing with around issues of sustainability, overcrowding, over tourism, not enough inclusivity, we were growing exactly as you said, so quickly that we almost didn't have time to stop and think about that stuff. No, no. And then Mother Nature just said, okay. I'm going to give you time and mm-hmm. she grounded us all and mm-hmm. the, the, the the interesting thing about what's happened is that it's not just the value of travel that has shifted in the last year the values of travel have shifted to me spiritual leadership is simply leadership that interestingly agnostically and I haven't thought about this before it agnostically mm. connects people through their humanity Definitely. not through the badges of religion, nationality, age, gender, whatever it might be. It's mm-hmm. just, you know, acts of God, which COVID-19 has been, require, has required a lot of prayer. Mm-hmm. And I don't care how someone prays, as long as they find a way of staying hopeful and having faith. Mm-hmm. So I think in going forward, spiritual leadership is simply recognizing that we are all the same. There is a common denominator there. Right now, it is fear. Right now, it's hope. And right now, it is, in many ways, fatigue. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I think spiritual leadership is, is about looking for the common foundation yeah. rather than seeking out separation. Hello, and welcome to Women We Watch in Tourism podcast series. WWW is a platform where we provide a space for women to leverage collective wisdom, experiences and inspiration from women powerhouses in our industry to become innovative game changers. We will be engaging in insightful conversations with women who have changed the face of businesses in our industry and trailblazers who have steered innovative and creative ideas. This is a must-listen podcast for women leaders, professionals and entrepreneurs to become visible, break glass ceilings and to grow their impact. We believe that sharing these insights will be a catalyst for women in our industry to unleash their potentials and to seize the crisis as a turning point. So join our conversations by subscribing to Women We Watch in Tourism podcast. Hello, everyone. I'm Nisha, your host for today. Welcome to Women We Watch in Tourism episode one. We all have at least one woman in our lives that we watch, admire, and get inspired by. Join me today as I converse with one special guest who has inspired me and many other women in our industry, Anita Mendirata. Anita is a highly committed tourism practitioner, author, diplomat, and an on-air personality. She leads Anita Mandirata and Associates, a respected London, UK-based international consulting firm. 
Anita is also honored to be the special advisor to the Secretary General of the UNWTO and a strategic advisor to CNM International. With more than 20 years of professional and living experiences across almost all continents, Anita has an innate ability to feel the heartbeat of economic, social, political, and environmental dynamics of nations in times of both crisis and growth. Most recently, Anita has taken on a critical global role as a trusted advisor of government and business leaders seeking to understand the impact of COVID-19, guiding them through short, medium, and long-term decision-making to rebuild the strength and sustainability from not just an economic, but also a humanitarian perspective. So let's get started with our conversation with Anita Mendirata. Hello, Anita. It's so lovely to have you on our very first episode of our podcast, Women We Watch. Thank you so much for gracing us on our very first episode. How are you doing? I am doing very well. And Nisha, I'm very grateful. I'm honored and I'm touched. And it's a delight to be with you in Singapore, me calling in from London. But genuinely, thank you. I'm very, very honored to be your first interviewee. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm so excited to speak with you. And I'm going to begin with a, a personal question. You know, um, I've known you and I've, I've known a little bit about your background. And we have seen that you have journeyed from Canada to South Africa to London to even in you've been living in Malawi as well. So tell me from your childhood, you know, from the which destination has got one of the best memories in your heart oh goodness me you're you're, you're challenging <laughs> the un role now where you're not supposed to choose favorite children um <laughs> i think if i look back at it nisha i've been i've been it, traveling since i was in diapers um because i was mm -hmm. born and raised in canada my family's family are all in india and uh -huh. so being an indian child of course you're taken across every year to meet the family and after that, and so that was back and forth for several years. And then when I was growing up in Canada, I was very blessed in that my father was a Rotarian. He's with Rotary International. And that exposed me to traveling, not just physically, but psychologically and understanding mm -hmm. different parts of the world. I then moved, as you were saying, I moved to Malawi after that. And then from Malawi to London, London, South Africa, South Africa, back to London, but I've had the blessing of through my work, I think it's 102 countries so far. And oh my God. Uh -huh. Admittedly, I don't have a favorite per se, but there are distinct countries that leave distinct impressions, some culturally, some emotionally, some environmentally, some economically, mm -hmm. and all of them create the tapestry that is our world. So I don't have a favorite, but I do mm -hmm. have massive gratitude for every single place I've been able to see and touch and be welcomed into. Anita, you know, um, since the time I've, you know, been acquainted with you, I've, I've, I've got really high regards for you. And, you know, you are an esteemed personality in the tourism and hospitality industry, being a strategic advisor to uh, the CNN International, to being a partner to UNWTO. But, you know, besides your, your professional credibility, right, I've always been um, awed by the warmth that you hold. You know, I think you, you, you wear your heart on your sleeve when you speak. You know, you, you speak with such honesty and I think compassion that to me are remarkable traits of a leader in the current business environment. So, you know, with that, I, I want to speak a little bit more about, uh, can you share a little bit about your professional journey. Oh, I shall do with, um, with great gratitude. Um, I often get asked how I ended up doing what I'm doing and the whole background to my business. And I always argue that it's, it was created with one word and a lot of that is serendipity. And mm -hmm. my professional journey started off back in Canada, did my undergraduate there, and mm -hmm. it was all in communications, marketing and communications. And mm -hmm. It's, I'm grateful that you 
tap into some of the texture behind my background. So it was classical marketing, classical communications, but I took a course on advertising. And I'll never forget because one of the assignments we were given was to choose an advertisement that touched us. Mm -hmm. And it was back in the days of billboards. And I was driving to university one day and I noticed it was around Christmas time. And there was a, a billboard of for the Salvation Army. And it was simply a silhouette. All it was was a silhouette of clearly a homeless man on a sidewalk. And he's looking up and there's a Salvation Army attendant looking down and putting his hand out. And mm. all it said on the billboard was, for the love of God, give. Mm. And I mm. just melted thinking, I love the double wow. of the language, mm. but it showed me the power of words and imagery. And I love the fact that an advertisement for the Salvation Army could have such spirit and such human connection. And that, quite honestly, started me on my path in terms of developing a career initially in advertising and marketing. Mm -hmm. I then went to, um, from there I went to um, IBM in Canada. I then went on um, a holiday to visit my father in Malawi and got hired by Unilever. So spent three and a half years in, in Malawi with Unilever, which I was very blessed that they sponsored my doing my master's in marketing. Mm -hmm. um, I then went with Unilever to London and from London to South Africa. And then from um, Unilever got hired by Coca-Cola in, mm -hmm. in Southern Africa. Mm -hmm. And then was brought on by the Added Value Group, um, one of the WPP consulting agencies run by Sir Martin Searle or championed by Sir Martin Searle. Mm -hmm. And I started getting involved in nation branding initiatives. And mm -hmm. it was it was interesting because we were working on Brand South Africa. This is at the time when nation branding became very popular and image development behind nations. And I was working with the firm and one of my stakeholders was the World Bank. And I went across to Washington and I was showing them the concept boards for this multi-sectoral brand that was going to cover tourism, trade, investment, film and events. Mm -hmm. And a stakeholder, a gentleman named David Bridgman, asked me, and it was one of the turning points in my life, he asked me, he said, this is all great, you're showing me these boards, what's the ROI? And Nisha, the penny dropped for me. Mm -hmm. And I said, mm -hmm. well, tourism is not about just the tourists. It's the Absolutely. impact that they have economically, socially, culturally, environmentally, and spiritually, because you don't want countries selling their soul for the sake of tourism. Certainly, yeah. And, and that's when I went on my own. That was 19 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was very blessed to have three great iconic brands behind my name, Unilever, mm -hmm. IBM, Coca-Cola, and then the other. Certainly, Amazon. yeah. And then I went solo, and I had two rules, Nisha, for my my biz, building my business. And that mm -hmm. was simply, this is my vocation, not my profession. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I will only work with clients that I love. And wow. because if I'm going to be working through the night, I want to be working through the night because the clients I'm working for are people I genuinely love and respect and want to help. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do it for the numbers. If you're doing it right, the numbers will follow. And those two simple little rules has served me well for every single day of the 19, almost 20 years that I've had my Absolutely. business. I think that's what keep our passion or rather, you know, our obsession going, isn't it? Exactly. The, the, the sense of purpose has to be deeper than Definitely. wallet. Definitely, definitely. And especially, I think, for the industry that we are in, you know, which is so, you know, grounded on, on humanity, isn't it? Exactly. And to your point that when we look at the statistics, I mean, before COVID-19, one in 10 jobs in the world, national identity and competitiveness, a sense of purpose and unity for citizens, whether they're traveling or not. Mm -hmm. And our industry has been has been broken because of this. And it's going to continue to be bruised and healing for a long time. And if we look at that, it's it's not 120 million jobs that been, have been lost. Mm -hmm. It's one person times 120 million families that have Absolutely. lost lives and livelihoods. Yes. How yes. do we help that? And so a lot of what I've been doing in the last year and a half is simply mm -hmm. holding the hand and putting my hand on the back of leaders to mm -hmm. keep them moving forward. Because being mm -hmm. 
we've all dealt with crisis in the past, terror yeah. attacks, natural disasters, economic. Definitely. So many crises has affected our industry here. But this is the first time everyone in the world has been hit by an invisible crisis. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. So people can't separate the work from the personal. It's all no. very primal. And no one in crisis should ever feel alone. And so that's, yeah. that's been my call of duty for the last year and a half. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and since you're talking about, you know, the current uh, pandemic, right, and the impact that it has in our industry, but it has also given us a invaluable opportunity to examine the insensible tourism development that we have focused on uh, in the past, you know, where we were focusing on the trajectory towards growth and numbers. Today, we have to look at how tourism can help flourish communities and destinations, you know. So if I were to, you know, ask your perspective, like what pressure should be placed on our leaders today for changes to happen in our tourism industry to take a turn towards something more regenerative? It's a, it's a lovely question, and I, I love the fact that you're making it very specific around who should be doing what. Mm-hmm. I, I firmly believe, Nisha, that in her former life, Mother Nature was a tourism practitioner mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. The, the changes mm-hmm. that are being forced have been, and I use the word forced purposely, have been smart. Mm-hmm. And, um, mm-hmm. Because if you think about it, all the challenges we were dealing with around issues of sustainability, overcrowding, over tourism, not enough inclusivity. We were growing exactly as you said, so quickly that we almost didn't have time to stop and think about that stuff. No, no. And then mother nature just said, okay, I'm going to give you time. And Mm -hmm. she grounded us all. And the, 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 the interesting thing about what's happened is that it's not just the value of travel that has shifted in the last year. The values of travel have shifted. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Over- what a beautiful thing. Yeah. Well, I think as well, it's interesting is that over tourism and the overcrowding issue before this all happened, mm-hmm. it was always deemed to be about bad management and bad tourism mm-hmm. leadership. That mm-hmm. was part of it. Mm-hmm. But there was also the responsibility at a traveler level that it was also bad manners. Mm-hmm. Just, because, mm-hmm. just because I have the ability to book a flight to Singapore and yeah. show up at your house and have my credit card and my mobile phone and my passport does not give me permission and the right to feel entitled to walk in your house without knocking on the door and taking off my shoes. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. The spirit of entitlement of, yes, but I bought my holiday. I have the right to do this. No, 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 no. We mm, have the privilege mm. to do it. And even even elements like, for instance, we always talked about community tourism and rural tourism. Yeah. By being shut in, we've seen the impact on SMEs and SMMEs, which were over 80% of our industry. Yeah. Their lives have been stopped and threatened because of the lack of tourism. Mm-hmm. So... There's been an awakening, if I can find it, and whether we call it sustainable tourism, responsible tourism, regenerative tourism, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we need to be seeing it purely as tourism conscious of the impact of everything we do for Mm -hmm. the visitor and the visited and build from there. So I I think, I mean, one one of the most brilliant outcomes of this challenge has been the focus on domestic tourism. Mm-hmm. Domestic tourism was almost uh, the poor cousin of international tourism. Yeah. And we would, you know, we'd deal with it later. And yet, because of the, the security bubbles, governments had to shut borders and skies rightly. This is a healthcare crisis before it's an economic and a tourism crisis. Mm-hmm. Which forced people desperately needing to get out again to explore their own countries which has been amazing because it's appreciating mm. the people that you live with. Absolutely, with. absolutely. Mm. It deals with issues around seasonality because now you have year-round travel. It deals with dispersion because people are going mm-hmm. outside of the tier one cities. You mm. get repeat visitation. It inspires destination innovation and partnerships mm-hmm. and higher yield. It's brilliant. So. Right. When the world opens up, the baseline of the tourism economy is going to be lifted 
because domestic tourism has helped build a stronger foundation off mm -hmm. of which then you can build international. So mm -hmm. there's some good tourism economics lessons coming out of this time. Certainly, certainly. And it's not only economic lessons, but I think we have seen lessons on leadership. You know, I, I feel that the pandemic has defined leaders and leadership. You know, and we have, you know, so we have seen some really, you know, amazing leaders who have risen during this period and leaders who have demonstrated emotional intelligence, compassion, empathy, as well as they are vulnerabilities, you know, and many of them have actually been women, right? We have seen that happening in the recent past. And However, on the other hand, I've also seen that the crisis has also exposed what many of us have already known is that women are also underrepresented at the decision-making tables. Indeed. And, and I think, mm -hmm, sorry, carry on. Yeah, go ahead, Anita. I think it's a time for us to start looking at a women in leadership and not just about inclusion, but it's about transformation today. What do you think? I, I think it's it's an interesting, it's a very important conversation. And now is the time to redo the calculus. I, I agree with that. I think what's important though, and I'm because you've spoken about two significant pillars of the future of our industry. Leadership has moved from being a noun and a title to a verb. Mm, it's, mm. it's been fascinating to see how in this time of crisis, many leaders have stepped up and mm -hmm. many have stepped out mm, but mm, I give mm. a huge amount of grace for lack of better words Nisha in that crisis is is something that it, it's wiring how we respond to crisis is based on wiring some people respond to crisis by I run to the fire you are someone who runs to the fire and that's all instinctive that is mm. literally instinctive response some mm. people run away and that's okay. If there's one thing I've learned this past year in terms of leadership is that we can't judge context. And mm. I say to my team that we have no idea what's going on behind people's screens. Mm. We have no idea the context they're dealing with. If someone's having a bad day, mm. we've all had a bad year and a half. We cannot compete in who has suffered more or less. Mm. And so I think to your point about the exposure of leadership, if anything, it's demonstrated the power of humanity as a critical part of the DNA of leadership. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I find when I'm interviewing leaders about what they've learned about themselves, mm -hmm. they've admitted men and women, they have had to be honest and emotional with the people with whom they engage, whether mm -hmm. they're government leaders, business leaders, whoever they are. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. Linking to your question about men and women rather than men versus women, I think this crisis has been a blessing in how it's, ex it's exposed the value of EQ and SQ in terms of Absolutely. spiritual mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. leadership. Women were just more natural in demonstrating that aspect of who we are as personalities. Mm -hmm. And it's almost given men permission to show their more emotional sides without being deemed weak. Mm -hmm. I'm also a fierce believer, Nisha, in that, I mean, I, I don't ever want a job because I wear lingerie. Mm -hmm. I mean, you mm -hmm. are a beautiful, smart, attractive, gorgeous woman who has a huge brain and an amazing sharpness and an amazing sense of vision and aspiration. I would assume you would want those latter attributes to be why someone gave you a leadership position, not because you're this gorgeous woman, which you are. Mm. Um, and I think that's where, if we want a seat at the boardroom table, mm -hmm. banging on the boardroom door doesn't help. No. Because it's going to just frighten the people on the inside of the room. <laughs> to mm -hmm. not <laughs> Change happens from within. And the change happens and the door is opened when there is appreciation given to what's mm -hmm. on the other side of the door. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I really think this is a, I mean, on, I, I remember a couple of years ago on International Women's Day, mm -hmm. someone was saying about, you know, we need to be 50-50. And I just said, no, we need no. to be 100-100.
That's you know, another thing. Yeah. That's where, and I think that's where this crisis has allowed us all to appreciate humanity as the mm-hmm. basis of future development and strength. Absolutely. Not gender. Absolutely. And I love that word. Uh, the kind of leadership that you mentioned, you know, spiritual leadership, it's very, it's something that very few people can understand and appreciate, you know, specifically, I am a strong believer of spiritual leadership in our industry. Can you give me your insight as to what you would define as spiritual leadership? I, it, I love your questions. Um it's funny, when people often hear the term spiritual leadership, they think that I've got incense burning in my office. No. <laughs> I, I love my candles, but that's not <laughs> To me, spiritual leadership is simply leadership that, interestingly, agnostically, and I haven't thought about this before, it agnostically mm. Mm. connects people through their humanity, Definitely. not through the badges of religion, nationality, age, gender, whatever it might be. It's mm-hmm. just, I, I mean, I, I, you know, acts of God, which COVID-19 has been, requ- has required a lot of prayer. Mm-hmm. And I don't care how someone prays, as long as they find a way of staying hopeful and having faith. Mm-hmm. So I think in going forward, spiritual leadership is simply recognizing that we are all the same. There is a common denominator there. Right now, it is fear. Right now, it is hope. And right now, it is, in many ways, fatigue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think spiritual leadership is is about looking for the common foundation rather than seeking out separation. Definitely. I think the the core word here is, you know, it's, it's about the interdependence. Exactly. And that interrelationship that, we have with each other as a community, as well as with the ecological, you know, uh, environment around us as well. So, I mean, I, I think spirituality has got a higher purpose. You know, it, it kind of like transcends to something higher and larger than ourselves, you know, and I think our industry has been so grounded on the, the whole individuality of the people, you know, individual countries working with their own agenda, but spiritual leadership is going to take us to a higher purpose of what really tourism is all about. I also, I just want to pause for a second on the words that you said just now, Nisha, which is one that I think is really important. We've always talked about the tourism value chain and experience being integrated and interdependent and interconnected Mm -hmm. and, or rather not the middle word, but the shift that has taken place, and I was, I was speaking on a, and I was blessed to be on a panel with um, CNN's Richard Quest, who's a dearly loved colleague and friend, Willie mm-hmm. Walsh, the new DG of IATA, who is just exceptional as a leader, exactly mm-hmm. a right leader at exactly the right time, mm-hmm. and the Honorable Minister of Tourism of Greece, who's magnificent. And we were talking about, Richard was pushing the whole, we need to make sure that the restart of tourism is interconnected and integrated. And because we're seeing from whether it's destination, hotel, airline, cruise, airport, immigration, foreign affairs, health, all of these things. Mm -hmm. And I jumped in and I just said, but wait a minute, this is no longer about integration. Mm -hmm. It's about Mm -hmm. interdependence. Mm -hmm. Because unless we have the health certificates, you're not getting on the plane. Mm -hmm. Unless the airports are ready with that, the passenger's not able to fly. Mm-hmm. We have a fundamental interdependence now mm-hmm. where everyone is grounded. And I think that's really healthy because it's no longer about what I want. It's what does someone need mm-hmm. to keep me moving. Mm-hmm. That's, and I think that's where from a traveler perspective, mm-hmm. even if we've got situations where PCR tests are hopefully one day free and we've got the, the vaccination certificates, et cetera, mm-hmm. if the government borders aren't open, or no. if there's some issue with regulations, no one's going anywhere. Simply. No. Mm-hmm. So I think the, it's almost as if that, that spiritual understanding has shifted to operational interdependence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then and only then is there going to be confidence in traveling again because people won't get stuck. That's Absolutely. when we're going to reopen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm so glad, you know, to see that sometimes even that the pandemic has shifted the language that we are using, you know, 
uh, to describe uh, leaders or to, to describe communities or what tourism and the meaning behind it. I think we're seeing a big shift in the way that people are conversing today. Right, um, Anita, I want to ask you as you are speaking, you know, for, for you to get where you are and even as women, you know, we, we need a tribe, you know, sometimes to support us, inspire us and motivate us to get where we are today, you know. And to you, who was your mentor? Who was your role model who inspired you or believed in you? Hmm. Um, goodness. I think it started <laughs> without question with my father, who's just, mm -hmm. my, I, I, I suffered terribly from a father-daughter relationship. I absolutely uh -huh. agree. Uh -huh. And he, he was always, he was a believer in me by example, not necessarily uh -huh. by me waking up every morning and him saying he believes in me. Um, but he exposed me to, like I said, a community in Rotary International where growing up as a little girl, we were exposed to the Rotarians ongoing. Mm -hmm. And these were mm -hmm. highest level professionals right across all industries. And so we weren't kids. We were almost like little adults and we had to behave with right. the respect and the appreciation, but recognizing we're still, we're still kids. Right. So that shaped a great deal. And then Nisha, I've always been a believer that we have mentors, we have our champions, but we also have our guardian angels. And Absolutely. we can choose mentors and champions, but our guardian angels choose us. Right, and, right. Um, and I know you and I've had this conversation in the past about there are times in our lives when people just swoop in and they're just there to, to guide us, to protect us, to push us. Absolutely. And, and I've been very, very blessed to have some swoop in at some of the most mm -hmm. critical times in my life. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. And, and that's where, I mean, when I reflected on the gentleman, David Bridgman from the World Bank, if I look at it, one of the turning points in my life was when, when I first ran across Richard Quest from CNN. I was mm -hmm. in Dubai. Mm -hmm. at, um, at, at, I was a guest of the Dubai government at, at Roots. And he and I happened to get into a debate in front of this beautiful gentleman, Ronnie Rod, who's now the president of CNN Commercial. And... Richard was making a comment, some comments about his perspective on Dubai. And I just said, you know, you need to understand the strategy behind the scaffolding and what it is. And mm -hmm. I overheard this. And 14 years later, I'm still with the CNN team and I'm so mm -hmm. grateful for them. Right, right. And I immediately went back to Richard and I said to him, you know, you will always be one of the most important people in my career. Because had we mm -hmm. not gotten into that debate, mm -hmm. Ronnie would never have overheard the conversation and the relationship has grown. Right. So I think the there are people that I innately admire, um, and I'm really blessed to have many of those around me. Because I think, I think Nisha, you and I are aligned in that we subconsciously gravitate towards people who have the Absolutely. same of purpose and principle, Absolutely. and and just pull away subconsciously from those who don't. Mm, mm. So it's almost communities of people that inspire me. Um, but there are distinct people to whom I give immense thanks for the impact they've had on my life. No question. Definitely. definitely. And I also believe, I think, Anita, that uh, we have to be very open to let the guardian angels in rather than be territorial right. or guarded, you know. And I think a certain level of porosity is also important, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and th that humility and gratitude are yeah fundamentally important because they choose us we don't choose them and they Absolutely. can be the most awe-inspiring huge people in the world but they saw something and that's something i think as 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 leaders we have to then carry on mm -hmm. and i find mm -hmm. those people that we can tuck under our wings and protect and support because there's something special there they just need that that wing to nook under Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I think going back to you talking about support, I, I, you know, we had this conversation and I think your initiative of Rise Weekly was to support the industry, whether it's uh, leaders or students or, you know, uh, the the professionals in our industry. And, I, and I'm a fan of Rise Weekly, you know, I follow, I follow that and it's such a, 
inspiration, you know. Can you share a little bit about why you started that and what did this program or initiative do to your audience? Goodness, um, thank you. I'm, I'm really, really grateful. And Rise was is a labor of love. It is mm-hmm. to me something that I, I am I am every single day and every episode grateful for. The way it started was this, and it's literally as as naive and simple as this. Mm-hmm. Back in March last year, I was blessed to do a keynote at a um, a summit, the um, Young Hospitality Young Hotelier Summit, run by mm-hmm. EHL. Mm-hmm. And last minute, it had to go virtual, and the professor who put me forward as the keynote speaker, um, Professor Damien Hadari at EHL. I'd, only, I'd, I'd keynoted for him at a lecture series at EHL the previous two years. So we knew each other tacitly. I think I'd spent no more than eight hours of my life with him through those two occasions. And YHS did this virtual summit and it was fascinating seeing it all come to life. And I would just became very sensitive to the fact this is when literally on a daily basis, borders and skies were shutting. People were locking in. Mm-hmm. And I just I was watching, it was like watching those slow motion films of when you see uh-huh. the human walls falling. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And I reached out to him and I said, Damien, there's an entire world of people out there in our industry, especially young people who are watching their futures fall apart. Because we didn't know how long this was gonna last. It was gonna be, you know, it could be the, the COVID, you know, the COVID experience might have been a hundred days, a hundred years. We had no idea. No one knew what was going on. Mm-hmm, All the news, mm-hmm. the world was shutting. And so I said to him, "We need to do something." And he and I just literally just said, "Well, it, 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 we just need to have a conversation about what is going on and helping people be honest about the questions we, we're just trying to articulate because there are mm-hmm. no answers." Mm-hmm. And so we decided to create this program. It was not going to be a lecture. It was not a webinar. It was going to be a program based on simply conversation. Mm -hmm. Us speaking to leaders of the highest levels right across the industry, across the world. And we then decided, we co-created this. It does not make one penny. It never has. My team Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. took on production. He had his team supporting. It was amazing. And we just created the DNA of it, because being a marketer, we created the brand properly. We Mm -hmm. called it Rise for a reason. We wanted to give optimism and hope without being naive about it. We did it on a Monday purposely to kickstart the week. And it was just supposed to be a safe place for 100 days for people to come together to separate the news from the noise, listen to leaders, not just about how they're leading their businesses and governments, but how they are feeling as leaders. Wow. Mm-hmm. Have a good laugh. You know, just, and, and it's so funny because Damien and I didn't know each other as friends. Rise started, we thought it was going to be 100 days. We had every single international leader we reached out to, which is now more than 60, said yes. We're into season four, so we're past 130 days. Oh, wow. Um, It's been spectacular. And Damien and I, I don't know how the alchemy happened. Someone someone called us once, Sunny and Cher, because we banter a lot, we laugh. And I just said, yes. I'm Sunny, he share. So, <laughs> and, and I'm so grateful to him because when I reached out and said, we need to do something, he said yes. Mm. And I think the motivation behind it, Nisha, was simply this, and I say this to my girls in my business, that mm-hmm. if we feel safe enough to be able to help someone, we have to help someone. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's that's what's kept Rise going. It's just you can't not do something if someone calls in a 911. You can't not. Mm. No. So I think that's where my rotary daughter came out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But it's been glorious and it's given us all momentum and a sense of, of purpose and a source of intelligence and insight and a good laugh. So that helps. Um, you know, the, the thing about this particular podcast, right, it's called hashtag WWW, Women We Watch, right? And and we want to share the lived experiences and narratives of women leaders who have been a source of inspiration to us. And Anita, I remember the very day I saw you on stage at the UNWTO Gastronomy Conference, all right? And I said, that's my inspiration, okay? <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> and I followed you, you know, till a day that I was blessed to be next to you in Cape Town. And I said, oh, my God, you know, she is my inspiration. Right. And so tell us, this is our signature question. So who is that one woman that you watch? Oh, my goodness me. Um, I, I, it's, it's a great question and, and I'm, I'm glad I didn't know it. Um, I, this is going to sound awkward and backwards, but mm -hmm. I'm going to say in a, in a strange way, myself. Oh, wow. Simply, mm -hmm. But simply for this mm -hmm. reason, so that mm -hmm. I never, if I ever watch myself being ungrateful, All right. unhelpful, Mm -hmm. unpurposeful and mm -hmm. untrue something's going wrong mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I take that question more from the point of view of watch to make sure I never lose my true north mm. oh wow I love it I love what you just said it's like watching your mirror isn't it just it's it's almost a watch yourself young lady right <laughs> it's probably the answer you didn't anticipate but it's um, I know. It, if there is one woman i watch in terms of being a lady mm -hmm. a woman named b tolman she's the mm -hmm. matron of the tolman family and the president of red carnation hotels who is this exquisite exquisite elder who she is to global hospitality, what Coco Chanel was to Chanel. Oh, right. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. she's one of those exquisite international leaders who is literally one of the hoteliers of the world um, mm -hmm. in terms of honors. But she's always elegant and graceful and grateful and mm -hmm. an absolute lady. And no matter how powerful she is, she never pushes power. Her oh, wow. power comes from the intense respect and wonder that she generates with the people around her. And I think, as I be, I'll be quite frank with you, and I, I love you as a friend, so I can say this. Mm -hmm. I think women need to be very careful in their mm -hmm. quest for success, right. not being men in skirts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And if I ever feel she or my father grabbing me by the ear and just saying, you forgot to say please and thank you, or mm -hmm. that's not how a lady behaves, I'm mm -hmm. failing no matter what I'm doing. So mm -hmm. people like she are really important, I think, as, as lifestyle and life principle role models for women. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a, a great reminder, really, really a beautiful reminder to all of us you know, listening in. And we're human at the end of the we day. Are. We are. We this are. has been a scary time, and that's why, I, and I think, almost think that, you know, I, 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 you know me, I play with words, and with the WWW, I was thinking about oh. the, mm -hmm. the women we watch, and I thought, it almost feels as if it, in my head, it, the WWW is wonder with women. Wonder of it, women. Oh, wow. <laughs> See, there's something about appreciating and seeing right. in the world around us that's really exactly, important. exactly. And I know as you were talking, I was like, two words came, you know, it's, it's comforting um, as well as inspiring, you know, listening to you and what you have shared. And I hope that our listeners are feeling that way today. But I'm, I'm grateful to you, Nisha, a for creating this series because I think you you are you are ensuring that people have gotten used to the comfort of the discomfort zone of this time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're we're forgetting the again at the end of the day, in the first quarter of COVID, people were forced to recognize their humanity. We can't lose that, especially as part of the world is opening up and getting ready to travel and excited while other parts are shutting down as the wave three hits. We, we cannot lose the humanity verb that we all adopted at the beginning of this. So oh. your series is very important in keeping people connected to that core, yeah. which I think is really beautiful. Thank and you. 
And it's a blessing in these times when we're always involved in these conversations professionally about what we do technically and operationally and strategically Mm -hmm. to just think about the why we do it. Right. Which is, that's a real, so thank you for that. You've you've kind of blown the dust off of some of my thoughts. Uh, I'm grateful for that. Thank you, Anita. I mean, this is a beautiful conversation to begin our our episode, you know, and um, it's so fortunate of us to have you on this show. And I'm sure every listener here is going to feel inspired after listening in. Can you tell us how our listeners can connect with you online if they are interested in finding out more about you or what you do? Indeed, uh, no, with great pleasure. Um, it's very, very simple. My website is my name. Um, it's anitamenderotta.com. So really, really simple. Um, and I, my address is there. I'm very happy to connect with anyone who wishes to, even if they just, they just want to chat. Because we meet people through our work, not because of our work. And so Absolutely. my relationship with you will continue regardless of what we're doing. That's Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so now I think that it's a, it's interesting niche as well, because I'm sure we remember at the beginning of your career when you'd see people around you and you just think, wow, you're amazing. And you'd mm-hmm. make contact with them and they wouldn't respond. Mm. And I've always mm. thought, I'm never going to do that. Yeah, Good unless life. it's something dubious, unless it's <laughs> then, then I, I wow. ask my, my lovely Grace to like, no, can you check out this? Um, but if it's just, if it's a, especially a young person who just wants to connect, we were there once. We must never forget that. Right, right. So yeah. my website's the doorway, and I'm very happy to open the door when it's knocked on. Oh, wow. Well, thank you. Such. I mean, it's such a nice personal touch to the end of our conversation, Anita. And and that's you. That that's your signature. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. And I wish you all the very best in your future episodes of your Rise Weekly, as well as the other initiatives that you're doing. And I can't wait to come and squeeze the life out of you when you meet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And as I always say, just stay strong, stay, stay, stay safe, stay hopeful. And one day we'll be saying safe travels. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. And that was Anita Mendirata. What a lovely and inspiring conversation. To all the listeners, thank you so much for being with us on episode one. If you like this episode or would like to share your views, please connect with us on womenwewatchtourism at gmail.com. You can follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn, as well as subscribe to our podcast on all leading podcast platforms. This is your host, Nisha, signing off from episode one.